Tonight we're going to look at two psalms, Psalm 73 and Psalm 74. Let's begin reading together here in, in Psalm 73, and I'll read through the psalm and we'll get into our study. Psalm 73, beginning at verse 1, this is a psalm of Asaph. Beginning at verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. And therefore, his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I've cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence for all day long. I've been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all, all those who desert you for harlotry, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. Now, as we begin Psalm 73, for those of you who take notes, you might want to note that this is the beginning of what is called the third section of the book of Psalms. When you study the Psalms, though there are 150 Psalms, the book of Psalms is actually divided into five sections. And these five sections that it's divided into, some would say even mirror the first five books of the Old Testament. It's divided uh, from uh, chapter 1 to Psalm 41 into the first book. Then you have Psalm 42 through 72. 73 through 89 consists of the third book. Uh, Psalm 90 to 106 is the fourth, and then 107 to 150 make up the fifth and concluding book of the book of Psalms. As I mentioned earlier, this particular psalm has been written by Asaph. And I want you to see how it begins here. Notice verse 1. Notice what he says. He says, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. As he begins, it's interesting to note that he proclaims how good God is to those who really trust him. A couple of things I'd like to point out as we begin our study here in Psalm 73. First, I would point out that there is something in this very first phrase that he gives to us that helps us in our walks with God. Notice how he says, truly God is good to Israel. I like to look at it and say, truly God is good, period. God is a good God. And God, because he is a good God, is good to the nation of Israel. When he says God is good, he's saying that he's good to those, and notice in verse 1, who are pure in heart. When he speaks concerning the fact that God is good to those who are pure in heart, he's proclaiming that God is good to those who truly trust him. When you have a pure heart, you have a clean heart, and they have a clean heart because they have a living faith towards him. Jesus, when he was speaking in Matthew chapter 5, said, blessed are the pure in heart, because he said they're going to see God. In order for us to have a relationship with God, then we need to understand how good he is, and we need to understand that God has done something on our behalf that demonstrates how good he is. You see, we who are Christians understand that God has done something that, that is beyond our understanding. God has loved us so much that he has given to us his son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for us, taking our place taken the penalty that was for us, 
that God has loved us and demonstrated his goodness to us in such a way that he actually gave his own son for us. So truly, God is good. God is good to those who have a pure heart. Truly, God is good to those who have been cleansed by faith and by the blood of Jesus Christ. Truly, God is good to those who have been regenerated. The Bible tells us it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. You see, the, the ram ransom was not works of righteousness. The ransom was something that God actually paid himself in the sense that he gave us his son Jesus who, who, who poured out all of his blood for us and because of that we can see how good God is. Now he's saying that these people who have recognized the goodness of God are those who have a pure heart and God is good to them because they have a relationship with him. So it's interesting how he begins in verse 1 to make that very strong statement, God is good to Israel to such as are pure in heart and then notice what he says in verse 2. He starts singing the blues. As for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You know, in life, very often it seems that the ungodly have it easier than those who fear God. When you look at somebody who doesn't have any outward faith at all, and you see how their life seems to be so pleasant. And, and sometimes from the outer appearance, we'll see the ease that they live in and, and all. It's so outwardly satisfying that it can cause a believer to stumble and slip. You can see somebody who's, who doesn't have any interest in God at all. You know, they, they don't go to church. They never talk about things of faith or anything. And you want to walk with the Lord. And, and, and you go outside and, and you look across the street and it's kind of like, like it, it's just sunshiny and warm and birds are singing and the trees across the street are, are, are blossoming and, and you look at your yard, it's filled with weeds. You look at their, their, their house and it's, it's beautiful. You look at your house and it's not. You look at their car, it runs. You look at their kids, they finish school. It's just different, you know. And, and you can say, Lord, it seems like, like they're so prosperous. It seems like everything they do, it just works for them. And for me, no matter how hard I try, Lord, it just doesn't seem to be working out. And I'm stumbling and I'm slipping. That's what he's talking about when he says in verse 2, As for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Why is that? Verse 3, I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Sometimes we, we may look and say, how is it that they seem to be doing so well? We might even get to the point of questioning the Lord about it. Uh, in Jeremiah, for example, in chapter 12, uh, verse 1, there's a scripture there that, that when we were studying through Jeremiah, it, it spoke to my heart because uh, Jeremiah 12, 1 reads, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yet let me talk with you about your judgments, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Look at Lord. You're perfect. You're wonderful. You're always doing the right thing. But would you mind if we have a conversation for just a moment? I would like to know why these dogs do so well. I would like to know how come they get away with so much and why it seems that my life isn't blessed sometimes at all. And that's basically what he's speaking about. And then he begins to elaborate. Verse 4, there are no pangs in their death. Their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. And so he's speaking about them, and he's saying, you know, they are, they are intimidating to people. They blaspheme you. Their lives are carefree. They're unconcerned about tomorrow. For them, life seems to be good. They have everything they desire and even more than they can use. Nothing they want is ever withheld from them. 
They live to a ripe old age and they die peacefully. What is going on? You know, uh, some of us who have buried our, our loved ones, some of us who have buried our parents or those whom we love very much, I have to tell you, when my father went home to be with the Lord, I have to tell you, when, when Marie's dad went home to be with the Lord, both she and I, in our own time, when that occurred, had that kind of question. I have to be honest with you, and I say that. My dad was one of these guys who was just a good guy, took care of his health. He was a man who, you know, was just, you know, just a, just a great fella. You know, he was a good husband. He was a, a great dad, a wonderful provider, hard worker, honest as the day is long. Didn't smoke, didn't drink, took an early retirement so he could care for my mom. Just a great, great man. And my dad dies at the age of 74. And then you see some old grumpy old bear of a guy who's been smoking and drinking and carousing. He's 100 years old and he's got one tooth. <laughs> and he's still just doing fine, just moving on down the road. And, and you wonder, how is that, Lord? How is it that some of these scoundrels, you know, just seem to live forever and the good seem to die young? That's basically what he's speaking about when he says in verse 4, there are no pangs in their death, their strength is firm. They, they die peacefully and they have no pain. As a matter of fact, through their whole life, they don't have any, any plagues and, and, and they, they, they wear pride like a necklace. They're very proudful people. These are the people who give themselves lavish birthday parties. I remember... Uh, not that long ago, watching a news broadcast where this fellow gave himself a birthday party that cost a million dollars, a, a million-dollar birthday party. Now, these are the guys who uh, will pillage other people's accounts and take money from their retirement so that they can live the way that they want to live. They can do what they want to do. They travel the world, stay in the best hotels, eat the best of foods drive the best vehicles, live in the best neighborhoods, have the best educations. They have everything that money can buy. They have everything that people would want. They even go so far as to say, you know, you guys want to believe in God, that's fine. And, you know, if you want to, you, you're a little benighted, you're a little ignorant. I mean, you know, but I can accept the fact that you want to be religious. But as for me, I don't need God. I'm doing fine without him. And that's what the psalmist is speaking about here. He's speaking about people like that. In verse 10, therefore his people return here. Waters of a full cup are drained by them. They say, how does God know? There's no knowledge in the Most High. And behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. So they live in abundance. They take from the poor to satisfy their own greedy material thirst. And all the time that they do this, they're sure that there is no God taking note of what they do. And they believe that they're going to get away with it forever. There's no fear of God in them at all. They believe that uh, there is no such thing as judgment. There's, there's nothing like that that concerns them. They don't believe in an afterlife. They think that they're just fine that way. Now, sometimes some of us might look out there and we ask ourselves questions. At least I do. And I've, I've taken these kinds of things to the Lord before on a personal level. And, you know, I'll tell you... The people, some of the people that really I have to take the Lord off in when I'm thinking about it is, is, is some of these guys who, who are merchants of pornography. And they're living the high life, you know, and, and, and they're ruining families. They're destroying lives. They're living high, you know, selling this material to young people, hooking them at an early age, which results in messed up families and broken marriages. And they're making so much money while they do it, and they have no shame whatsoever as they do this. And for me, it upsets me, and I'll ask the Lord, what's going on with these people? They think that God doesn't know. They think that God doesn't care, and they're not afraid of judgment at all. And so you can watch some people sometimes as they seem to be profiting and all, and you can get to the point, as he says in verse 13, where he says, surely I've cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. You know, I've tried to honor God with my life. It just doesn't seem to pay off. What good is it to care about righteousness and justice when evil is so predominant? And perhaps you 
as I sometimes might see it, it just as a, it just, the evil sometimes that I see that is, is being justified even right now and legalized and encouraged for us to, to believe in and, and to think is just fine sometimes amazes me. I was listening to a person who represents the uh, a family council who works for um, James Dobson's organization, and he was pointing out that uh, in, uh, in Canada, some of you probably already know this, in Canada, uh, James Dobson's organization, Focus on the Family, will broadcast certain, you know, material and all, and they can broadcast in, in the nation of Canada. But if they have any programs that speak concerning homosexuality, those programs are not allowed to be broadcast in Canada because speaking against homosexuality has been made into hate speech in Canada. And so they will not allow those broadcasts to be presented. So there's only one side of the argument that is allowed in Canada. There's nobody who's able to come up and say, now, wait a minute, have you spoken about how homosexuals die earlier? Have you spoken about the way that they die and the diseases that they die of? Have you spoken about the violent crime that is associated with the homosexual community? And uh, have you spoken about, and there are so many things you could speak about, but they won't allow that in Canada. You cannot speak concerning that because it is now hate speech. And it isn't that far from now that that could possibly become the law of this land also. It really isn't that far away where that could, kind of thing could take place here. And you can see that as it rises and all. And, and as the psalmist said, surely I've cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocence. It doesn't seem to pay off, Lord. It, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do the right thing here, but nobody seems to care. All day long I've been plagued, chastened every morning. Verse 15, if I had said I'll speak thus, behold, I would have uh, been untrue to the generation of your children. When I, I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Now, it's interesting how he says this in uh, verse 15. He says, if, uh, if I said, I'll speak thus, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. I didn't want to speak what was hidden in my heart because I didn't want to stumble those who believe in you. I didn't want to say things that would communicate my time of doubt and my, my, my feelings of sorrow because I don't want to cause a believer to stumble, so I've been keeping this basically to myself. Verse 16, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. It was something I just couldn't grab hold of. I didn't know what to do with, and I was puzzling over this, and I was sorrowing over this, verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. I was upset. I was concerned. I was thinking that evil was going to win. I had gotten to the point where I thought, what's the use? Why even cry out any longer? Why even feel these things? My heart seems to be broken in, in sorrow when nobody else cares. Nobody cares about what they're doing. Nobody cares about the repercussions. When I watch the evil in, in, in society, he's saying, when I watch these blasphemous individuals who live so well, they have anything their heart desires, anything they want they can have. And I begin to think, it just isn't paying off for me. The answer hasn't been staying home and stewing over it. The answer isn't just saying, I give up. The answer, and this is really practical, by the way, the answer is going to worship you. The answer was entering into the sanctuary and getting an eternal perspective. The answer is hearing your word and your promises repeated in my life and embracing those things and understanding their end. Eternity is opened up, and I now realize that though they may have lives that many envy, this is all they're ever going to have. And when I went into the sanctuary, I became aware of your word once again. Like the psalmist in Psalm 119, 130, as he says, the entrance of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. You know, some people can see how the world is going 
in the wrong direction and they can be so overwhelmed by it that they just backslide. They just give up. They say, why go against the flow? Might as well just, just go along with it. I mean, because let's face it, I, I, I'm just one person screaming against the, the, the storm. There's, you know, my voice can't even be heard. It's, it's useless. If I may, I'll, I'll just personalize that for a moment. As a pastor teacher, I, I, I can sometimes feel the same kind of way. I can feel the same kind of way. I can get discouraged too. I, I can look at a small city such as the city of Chino and I can say, you know, it's a, it's a city that's not that large. It can be won for you, Christ, and yet, Jesus, it seems like nobody really cares that much. And, and, and Lord, when you look at just one city, let alone a county, let alone a state, let alone a nation, let alone a world, it seems like everything is stacked up against us. It seems like everything is causing a, an apathy in the heart of believers. And if I may, I'll, I'll give you an example, and then I'll, I'll continue and, and move on. But um, I think that there are a lot of people who, who see the political situation here in the United States, a lot of believers who basically say, you know what, we might as well give up. The things that we believe are never going to be recognized by, 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 you know, the government and all. The things that we hold most dear are the things that they seem to want to legalize. The things that we hate are the things that they love. You know, what's the point? What's the point of even voting? And there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of Christians who have told me that over the years. You know, I don't even vote anymore. What's the point? In the last election for president in uh, the year 2000, I, I wonder how many of you know that, that there was a survey done amongst evangelical Christians. I wonder if you know that out of the evangelical Christian population in the United States, it is estimated that 24% of evangelicals voted at the last election, 24%. That means 76% just stayed home. And I've had people say, you know, well, you know what, California is a very liberal state. What's the point of voting? That's the mentality that he's talking about. When I see the prosperity of the wicked, when they have abundance, it seems like I've cleansed my, my hands in, in vain, and, and it's not going my way. That's what he's talking about. He says, until I went to the sanctuary and I understood their end until I recognize that there is an eternity and that I have certain blessings God has given to me in eternity, I shouldn't be overwhelmed by the battle before me. I should recognize that God is in control no matter what it appears like. And even though the rich people seem to have so much now, they ultimately will stand before God, the rich who reject Christ, by the way. They will ultimately stand before God, and as they do so, they're going to receive judgment for the things that they've done. It reminds me of the story of the rich man in Lazarus that's recorded in, in Luke chapter 16, how there was a beggar by the name of Lazarus who was laid at the gate of a certain rich man. And the rich man would eat, well, banquets every day, the Scripture says. But, but, but Lazarus, this poor beggar, would basically be fed the scraps from the table and would fight the dogs for those table scraps. And on the one hand, you have Lazarus, who was a poor beggar in, in torn-up clothing, and you have a rich man who is dressed as the rich do in the finest of clothing. But the Bible says that they both died. The, the rich man was carried to his funeral, and angels carried Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham. And it was in that particular eternal framework that the rich man, being in torment, recognizes that he's lost for eternity, whereas Lazarus is being cared for and ministered to, and that gives to us the eternal perspective. And the rich man is told, you had the abundance while you were on earth, but now Lazarus receives what is his. And so that's an eternal perspective. You can have the fine car, and there's nobody to say there's anything wrong with having a nice car. You can have the fine clothes and all of that. But if you don't have the Lord, you have nothing. And sometimes people get so upset because it seems that they have no material things that you need to come to church and you need to get the eternal perspective. And that's what he's speaking about here. When he says in verse 18, you have set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment they're utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. 
They basically, in eternity, are going to receive that was their just due. Verse 21, thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. You see, before I began to worship you in the sanctuary, I was foolish and I was ignorant. I was even like an animal. My pity, my self-pity had reduced me uh, to the point of becoming a fool. And I began to doubt you and I doubted your goodness. But when I came to church, if you will, my heart was touched and I was instructed and perspective returned. The Bible tells us in Psalm 36, verse 9, uh, with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. You see, when I'm walking in the world and all, I, it, it's, it's really kind of like a dim, you know, I, I, I can stumble because I'm really walking in darkness. But when I have the light of eternity, when I see things the way they really are, then I'm able to make the right kind of judgment. Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? There is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In other words, and it's simple to say it this way, you are everything to me. And I think that that's the bottom line, isn't it? The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. I like that phrase, when Christ, who is our life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is our life. He's not a way of life, and he's not a way to life. He is our life, and that's why Paul could say, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. See, we're not religious people. We have a relationship with God, and we recognize that he has given to us life, and that life that he gives to us, he says, is more abundant. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, Jesus said, but I have come that you may have life and that more abundantly. And so in Christ, we recognize all of the things that we need are truly, truly in him. In verse 27, indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You've destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my, my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. So those who are far from God and are unfaithful will be destroyed. Though at one time he nearly slipped, he's now confident that God is going to sustain him. He didn't desert the Lord, nor did he stop coming to fellowship with God. He did what he knew he was supposed to do, and he knew that in putting his full trust in the Lord that God would do a full work in him. One of the scriptures the Lord gave to me as an early believer is Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the apostle Paul says this, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I have put my full trust in you. You are my life. There are times when you look out and you start asking the Lord why. Like Jeremiah, God, I want to talk to you about your judgments. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you why... And while that person over there continues to live a bit longer when the person that I love so much didn't live long, long enough at all. And I've come to discover that sometimes these little old scoundrels that live so long, it's because God has been very patient with them, giving them extra time to repent because, because God loves them and, and wants them to have a relationship with him. And rather than me getting all upset and worked over it, you know, I should say, Lord, you know, I thank you that you've given them one more, one more day. I can remember giving an invitation in this particular church many years ago now, and I remember during that invitation, a gentleman approaching and coming forward to give his heart to Christ, and this man was in his 80s. And I saw him kind of like, well, it took him some time to get up here as he was walking forward. And I remember looking at him and marveling and marveling at the patience of God, how the Lord it's long suffering kept working on this man's heart for all of those years all of those years 
And you know what? The Lord is good to us. And so rather than, than me getting resentful and upset, wondering how come that guy's got such a nice house and nice car, and how come he doesn't have to work out and, and, and he's got such a great build, and me, if I look at a hamburger, my eyes get fat. You know? What's going on here, Lord? No, I just said we need to have a perspective. And bro I'm, bro, I'm thinking of somebody right now as I'm talking to you. I shouldn't have said that. And people. Um, truly, the Lord is good. And verse 17 has got to be a verse that you just get into your heart. All of this was too painful to me until I went into the sanctuary of God and I understood their end. You've set them on a slippery slope. Slippery slopes. Some of us have been on them. My backyard has a slope, and it's clay. The dirt, is, the dirt is a clay. And when it's watered, if I climb up there to try and do some weeding or anything after it's been watered, man, I go flying down that slope. It's a slippery slope. And that's how their life is. There is no sureness, there's no firmness, there's no strength of foundation. But for us, who love the Lord, we have a sure foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And so when the storms do hit, we don't crumble under them because we have God on our side. And though there are seasons in our life where we feel that maybe we're getting shortchanged, when we take those concerns to the Lord and get that eternal perspective, we realize that though I live 70 or 80 years, that's nothing in eternity. And then I enter into eternity and am blessed with God providing for me for the rest of existence. My perspective returns. I, don't long, I no longer am resentful towards these people who have so much. And I begin to pity them because they don't have the Lord. Because they could have everything, but if they don't have Jesus, well, they really have nothing. Psalm 74, another psalm of Asaph. Beginning at verse 1, Oh God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance which you have redeemed, this Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Lift up your feet to the perpetual desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. They seem like, like men who lift up axes among the thick trees, and now they break down its carved work all at once with axes and hammers. They've set fire to your sanctuary. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them altogether. They've burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There's no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. Oh, God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out of your bosom and destroy them. For God is my king from, from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. You broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up mighty rivers. The day is yours. The night also is yours. You prepared the light and the sun. You have set all the borders of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people's blasphemed your name. Do not, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have respect to the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the inhabitants of cruelty. Oh, do not let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O oh God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. Do not forget the voice of your enemies. The tumult of those who rise up against you increases continually. And so in these verses here in Psalm 74, God has brought judgment on Israel, and that's what he's speaking about. And the psalmist is speaking how that, that the enemies have overwhelmed them. 
Now, the judgment that has come upon the nation is a fulfillment of a warning that God had given to them in the Old Testament. God had stated, if you take notes, it's found in Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verses 49 through 51. God had said that he would bring a nation against Israel from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly, nor, nor show favor to the young. They shall eat the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land until you are destroyed. They shall not leave you grain or new wine or oil or the increase of your cattle or the offspring of your flocks until they have destroyed you. And so this is a fulfillment that God had given to the nation of Israel if they were to reject him. He said, if you fail to do my commandments, then I will bring judgment upon you. And so as we look at this particular psalm, there's a lot of a discussion as to what it's speaking of specifically. I want you to notice with me that it speaks concerning the fact that they have had uh, the temple destroyed. So this was written uh, during the temple time. Notice verse 4 when it says, your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. Notice how it says in verse 7, they have set fire to your sanctuary. And so we know that this is speaking concerning the destruction of the, of the temple, that they brought it down and all. Now, we know that uh, this is more than likely a picture of what took place when, when the nation of Babylon under the king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar actually came in against the nation of Israel and brought destruction. We know that there were three incursions by, by King Nebuchadnezzar against the nation of Israel. And as these incursions against the nation came, they progressively destroyed that nation one after another, one time after another, starting in 605 before Christ, 597, and then finally in 586 B.C., in this massive onslaught, they progressively destroyed the nation of Israel. The Bible in 2 Kings 25, 8 and 9 says, in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, burned down the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great men, he burned with fire. So this is a picture of the destruction of the temple and how the onslaught has come against that nation. Now, it may also prophetically be picturing the time when a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, somewhere around 175 before Christ, who was a, uh, Syro, a Syrian king, how he came down, and not only did he pillage the temple, but he took a sow and poured her blood uh, on the altar and erected uh, uh, an image of the god Jupiter in the holy place, desecrating, as a matter of fact, it's a picture of the abomination of desolation that was spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and it's a, a reminder that Jesus speaks concerning Matthew chapter 24 when he refers to the abomination of desolation. That was a picture of what would take place in the last days. Not only did Babylon come in and destroy the temple, not only did Antiochus Epiphanes come in and desecrate it, but Jesus was speaking, and on one occasion in Matthew 24, spoke concerning the fact that not one of these stones is going to be left on the other one. And he, sp he spoke concerning the time that uh, Titus of Rome would come into the nation of Israel in 70 A.D., and he would actually destroy the temple. I was in Rome on one occasion, and I remember seeing a, uh, a monument in memory of King Titus and how that Titus had entered in, and there was, there was a picture that they had. It wasn't really a picture. What it was is a carving of uh, them taking the, the uh, Roman armies, taking the, the temple utensils out of, of the nation of Israel and bringing them back to Rome. And so there were, there were a series of destructions. And so uh, this particular picture more than likely has to be referring to the, uh, the first one when, when Babylon came in and destroyed and brought judgment. Now, the bottom line is here in Psalm 74 that their, their punishment is deserved. They're not arguing against the fact that it is. It is deserved. What they've done, they ought to receive punishment for. But at the same time, they're at this point beginning to feel abandoned. They understand that God's anger is just, and they know that God's anger is great towards them and that they need that judgment. Yet, at the same time, the psalmist is reminding the Lord of their past relationship and his tender love for them. You see, in the time of judgment, 
one of the wisest things you can do in a time when God is chastening you, one of the wisest things I can do is say, God, I deserve it. What I'm going through, there's no doubt about. I deserve it. Some people won't do that, though. I can't tell you as a pastor, I cannot tell you as a pastor how many times over the years I've been speaking to somebody who has done, you know, something pretty bad. And they want to argue about how it really wasn't that bad and where's God's love and where's God's grace and where's God's mercy. They want to argue that they shouldn't really be reaping what they have sown. One of the wisest things you can do is agree with God quickly. When the Lord says it's wrong, one of the wisest things you can do is say, you know what, it's wrong. And I've mentioned to you before that my dad didn't give me many spankings when I was a kid. There are a variety of reasons why he didn't. But one of the reasons why I didn't get many spankings from my dad when I was young is because when my dad would say to me, what you've done was wrong, I'd agree with him. I wouldn't argue with my dad. I wouldn't say there are extenuating circumstances or you don't understand what a, what a punk my big brother is and how he forced me to do these things. I never argued with my dad about that. My dad would say, you know what, David, you did something wrong. And I'd say, you know what, it was wrong. Because I didn't feel like getting a spanking. Because I knew, I knew that it was wrong. Why argue about it? It was wrong. But a lot of people, well, even to this day, and I see it with Christians, a lot of people, even to this day, when the Holy Spirit convicts them of their sin, they want to argue with God. They want to give you excuses and reasons why it's okay, or, or it's okay for me to do this. God's Word is true, of course, and it applies to other people, but see, my circumstances are different. No. One of the things we need to understand is God's Word is just across the board. And when he says, this is the way it is, the wisest thing that I can do is agree with him when he says, this is the way it is. And so they're, they're basically saying, what we have done is wrong. We just feel that we're abandoned. In Lamentations, in Lamentations 3, 31 through 33, uh, the writer says, the Lord will, will not cast off forever, though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. And so he's saying, Lord, I want to remind you of our past relationship. Notice verse 2. Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, the tribe of, of your inheritance, which you have redeemed, this Mount Zion where you have dwelt. And so he's reminding of his past relationship. Verse 3, lift up your feet to the perpetual desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. To see God's temple destroyed would have been traumatic. The place that had been set apart to worship God, the Holy of Holies, desecrated, would cause tremendous agony. Again in Lamentations, in chapter 2, verse 11, uh, the writer said, My eyes fail from weeping. I'm in torment within. My heart is poured out on the ground because my people are destroyed, because children and infants faint in the streets of the city. So, God, don't abandon me. Come again and care for me. One of the most precious scriptures that I know of in the Old Testament is found in Hosea. In the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verses 7, and I believe 7 and 8, listen to what it says. This is the Lord speaking. My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. And then as a father, I want you to hear this. If, it's, if I could only read this in the way that it should be read. The Lord is speaking, and he's speaking to the nation of Israel, and he gives them names. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I, I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zavuim? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. God tells us, when Israel was young, I took him by the hand. So many places in Scripture gives us the tender love that God has for that nation, guys. Even in the New Testament, Jesus speaking, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who stones the prophets and, and kills those who have been sent to you, 
How often, he says, like a mother hen wants to gather her, her chicks under her wing to, to, to save them against the hawk, how, how often I would have gathered you under my wings so that I could protect you, but you would not. How can I give you up? When he speaks concerning Adma and Zeboim, those are not names that you probably are familiar with. But when you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, when you know how that God brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, and you know the story, how that Lot was there, Lot being the nephew of Abraham, and how that Lot was there in the city and as, was sitting there as a judge when the angels who had been sent by God to destroy the nation because the sins of, rather, the cities, because the sins of those cities had, had risen into the, into the ear of God. God had smelled their sin, if you will, and, and came down to investigate and, and discovered that the, the cities were wholly given over to immorality and all, and God decided that it was time to bring judgment and all. Well, we know the name Sodom and we know the name Gomorrah, but there were other small cities, and two of the cities that were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah were Admah and Zeboim, and that's what he's talking about. He's saying, I don't want to destroy you the way I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and the small cities that surrounded that region. Listen, it's like you are my son, you are my child, and I love you with all of my heart. How can I give you up? How can I release you? I can't. One of the men in the Bible that I think that is worthy of us looking at closely is King David. King David was a, a very righteous man. The Bible tells us that, that God had sought him out, and he was a man after God's own heart. He's called the sweet psalmist of Israel, and from a youth he would sing songs to God, and he wrote many of the psalms that we're reading even as we go through our study. This was a young man who would sit out there in the wilderness as he cared for the sheep, and he would look to the stars, and he'd say, oh, when I consider the heavens, and that they're the works of your hand. What is man that you are mindful of him? And he would write these songs down. It's love songs to God. And God said that he was a man after his own heart. And yet we know the story. We know that David not only had a heart for the Lord, but he also had a, a fleshly desire. And, and we see that in his life, there were times that he had glorious experiences with God, and there were times when he didn't do so well. And one of the things that David didn't seem to do very well was he didn't seem to raise his kids well. He had a particular son by the name of Absalom. And Absalom was a very handsome young man. But Absalom had a rebellious heart. And we know the story of Absalom, how that Absalom stole the hearts of the people of Israel away from David, his father. Absalom would go to the place of judgment. He would be there at the gate when people would walk in, and he would ask the people who were coming in seeking justice, he would ask them, what are you coming for? And they'd say, well, I have a case I need to bring to the elders and all. He'd say, well, what's your problem? And they'd say, well, my problem is such and so. And he'd say, you know, if I were a judge... I would decide in favor of you because your, your cause is just. And the Bible tells us that Absalom stole the hearts of the nation of Israel, a nation that at one time was singing praise to David, how that Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. A, a nation that had fallen in love with King David has now turned their heart away from him and are now pursuing after Absalom, and Absalom calls an army to himself, and he rebels against his father with the intent to kill his own father. Well, one of David's generals hears that Absalom was fly, uh, fleeing from a battle, and because his hair was so long, he went underneath a tree and his hair got stuck in the branches, and the donkey that he was riding on left him hanging there, and a young man saw Absalom just hanging around, and he came back, and he tells the, he tells the, uh, the general, I just saw Absalom. His hair is stuck in a tree. And the general says, did you kill him? He says, you have got to be kidding. That's David's son. If I killed David's son then I'd lose my own life. So the general says, no way, where is he at? And he goes and he takes a spear and he thrusts him through and kills Absalom. Now, a great victory has been won. 
So they return to tell King David, and as they're speaking to David, the only thing David wants to know is, what about Absalom? And what about Absalom? You know the story. Would to God that all of your enemies were even as he is this day, meaning he's dead. And one of the most powerful things in Scripture is when King David's heart breaks right before you on the pages of the Bible. And we all know what he said. He began to cry out loud, and he said, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son, would to God that I'd have died and not you. Now think about the love of a father. Think about that concern and the passion in his heart. This is a man whose son turned against him. And yet, in the deepest recess of his heart, he was saying, I would have given up my life for you. And you know, when God says, how can I turn my back on you and make you destroyed like I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? I can't. I can't do that to you. Why? Because I love you. Because I love you. That's why. No, I won't forget that you belong to me. I won't forget that you are the apple of my eye. I won't forget. I'll even send my son for you. And as you see your sanctuary destroyed and the holy place brought to the ground, that ought to show you how I feel about sin. In verse 9, we do not see our signs. There's no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. Oh, God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out of your bosom and destroy them. God, you're not speaking to us. Heaven has become silent. We feel alone. We sense a separation. The sin is made between us and you. Verse 12, for God is my king from old, from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. You broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up mighty rivers. The day is yours. The night also is yours. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have set all the borders of the earth. You have made summer and winter. So he was remembering that God has delivered the nation from ancient times. And he's basically saying, Lord, I know that you've done it in the past, and I believe that you will do it now. Why is that? Well, because your power is, is all surpassing. You are, you are sovereign. And he uses nature as an example of the great power of God. If you're able to do these things in nature, you're able to deliver us also. In verse 18, remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. Do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have respect to the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Do not let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. So the people who have overwhelmed us are your enemies. They're blasphemous. They mock you and they revile your name, and your honor is now at stake. Notice verse 19, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. You're, in other words, our enemies are, are filled with contempt and they're filled with violence, and we feel helpless before them. Like a turtle dove uh, and a lion, there's nothing we can do to protect ourselves. So we're asking you to remember your promises to deliver us from our enemies. You have said that if we did so, if we turned to you, and you, would, you, would, you would save us. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and heal their land. And so we are remembering what you've said. We have turned, and we're turning to you. That's the way to do it, guys. Instead of arguing with the Lord, saying, I'm not that bad, you just turn to him and say, I need your help, God. Forgive me, and he will deliver you. Arise, verse 22, arise, O God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. Do not forget the voice of your enemies. The tumult of those who rise up against you increases continually. Move, Lord, for your own sake. Move, Lord, for your own name. 
It reminds me of Psalm 9, verse 19, when he said, Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Lord, it is your honor, it is your glory, it is to your benefit, and therefore I'm asking you to judge, to move, and to vindicate yourself. Because, Lord, I know that you will not abandon us. I know that you will come to our help. We deserve what we have received, but we also know that through your mercy, you will restore us. We trust you, Lord, and we'll follow you.